So we left off with this slide, right? Yeah, we did. We left off with this slide. We just finished talking about the premise uh, behind the indirect FIC method. That's the method that you are using in lab this week to measure cardiac output or to calculate cardiac output from a number of other measurements. The measurements are listed here. You will measure VCO2. You will measure, quote unquote, arterial CO2 and venous CO2. At least you can uh, infer arterial CO2 and venous CO2 from <coughs> manipulations during the test. And the manipulations we spent uh, a while talking about arterial CO2, if we equilibrate, if the gas that comes in in the venous blood quickly and completely equilibrates with the air in the alveoli and then that escapes, and you can measure that at the end of a breath, you should be able to get an, a, a sense or an accurate representation of what arterial CO2 is, right? Full, equal, equilibration, they should match by the time the blood leaves the, uh, the capillary, and so the air and arterial CO2 content should be the same. So measuring that at the end of a breath will give you an idea of the arterial CO2. It was more complicated to get a sense of the venous CO2 because we couldn't stop gas exchange from happening. As soon as the blood entered the capillary in contact with the alveoli, gas started moving. So we got around that not by stopping gas exchange, but by trapping the gas. And the CO2 would build up in the lungs, build up in the air in the lungs, and if we don't let that CO2 escape to the environment, we can measure or monitor the rate of the increase. And so the theory behind these measurements is what we covered before. And I'm briefly recapping that for you now because today, I'm assuming you have a good in-depth understanding of the theory now we're going to put numbers to it and do a couple calculations. So understanding the theory is really important. Why these things are being done the way they are is not the point of today's class. Now, it's let's look at some numbers that you might get in lab on Thursday. Let's run through the calculations that you have to do in lab for the next two labs and then um, see if we can't interpret uh, and understand the calculations so that on Thursday you're not sitting there like a deer in headlights. Uh, I did say briefly um, arterial CO2 and end tidal CO2 should match if we have full complete, uh, complete equilibration, which we do have. I'm showing you a trace. You've seen something similar for PO2 as it crosses the capillary across the alveoli. This is PCO2 in venous blood. Notice it starts higher and then almost immediately full equilibration as it matches the air in the alveoli. So you don't even need the full three quarters of a second of transit time at rest. You need a fraction of that for full, complete PCO2 movement. So there's no question arterial CO2 and alveolar CO2 should be the same. This is equilibrium. Now, if we can uh, measure that at the mouth, then we have a good idea of and our, our arterials, arterial CO2. So you're doing that in lab this week. And um, I don't know if Jody's been in contact with you, but what is important for this week is to find a volunteer that can exercise for this lab and for lab five. So I'm not going, you've already volunteered? No. <laughs> no? I'm not going to collect volunteers now, but it's important because what we want to do is compare the results between lab four and lab five. And people of different sizes and shapes, different uh, hormone and metabolism levels, different uh, fitness levels, all kinds of individual factors will affect your results and your ability to exercise at a given intensity and your cardiac output for that intensity. The thing that we're going to change is hydration status. We're going to manipulate 
blood volume. And we're going to see how that affects cardiac output, stroke volume, blood pressure, resistance, all those good things that we talked about calculating. So it's really important that everything else stays the same. That the subject, the participant, stays the same. Because we want differences in blood pressure and stroke volume to be due to the um, fluid restriction intervention that we're going to do. Not because it's a person that is now really super fit or not super fit or whatever the difference is. So keep, you want to volunteer for lab four, you also have to be able to volunteer for lab five. Doesn't matter who it is as long as it's the same person, okay? That said, we want to manipulate the uh, hydration status. So this week is um, be well hydrated. Whoever exercises, a good rule to follow is in the two hours before lab, drink a 500 ml bottle of water. Just in two hours. It doesn't have to be right away, half an hour before you get there. You don't chug it like five minutes before you enter lab. Gradually over the two hours, a little bottle like that, drink that. Okay? Whoever you are that's exercising. In contrast, for lab five, you stop drinking, I think, at 9 p.m. the night before. So maybe not 9 p.m., or at least just from the morning onwards, you don't drink anything. Because we want to institute some mild dehydration. The only other way to do it would be to uh, stick you in a sauna or have you exercise and sweat a lot and then not drink anything, which would confuse the results even more. So it's, it's easier, albeit somewhat a difficult battle, to always say, okay, my mouth's really dry. I can't drink, though, until 4 o'clock. All right, enough about that. Usually, this lecture comes up after the first instance of uh, the Rebreathe Lab. And so we sit here in class together, and you have your data, and we stare at the, uh, the Fick equation, the indirect Fick equation, and we ask the question, okay, we've done the Rebreathe, now what? You haven't done the Rebreathe yet. But if you understand the premise of uh, where these values are supposed to come from, we are going to jump ahead a little bit and then insert some um, representative values and do the calculations before you get to lab on Thursday. So you will be able, when you get the information on your printouts or that you take home with you afterwards, to say, oh, I remember a number like that. We would put it in this part of the equation um, uh, from the, the notes that we, we took in class. So we're leading lab a little bit right now. What do we need to calculate cardiac output? First thing we need, the easiest thing, the first stop would be VCO2. We need three things. The easiest is VCO2, so um, a lob ball for you just to uh, get our calculations off to an easy start. And even in your case, when you get to the lab, you're not going to have to calculate VCO2. It shows up on the printout. You might average three or four numbers to get the VCO2 over a given minute. Um, but I'm going to show you a, a bit of detail on how to calculate VCO2 if you didn't have that pre-calculated value from the metabolic curve. The rest of the slides are going to have a very similar format. Um, as we dive deep into a given variable, I'll show you the indirect pick at the top right. And we'll <coughs> cross off the, uh, the elements that we, that we calculate as we add to them. So VCO2... If you remember back to X phys, isn't only uh, spewed up by the machine, but you can physically calculate VCO2 with a few simple ingredients. The CO2 production of the body. CO2 production as measured at the mouth. Expired CO2 production. is a function of ventilation rate, VE, and the difference between expired CO2 and inspired CO2. So ventilation rate, how quickly am I ex uh, exhaling air, and then how much CO2 is being added to that air. The fraction of expired CO2 is the percent of CO2 in your breath. 
The fraction of inspired CO2 is the fraction or the percentage of CO2 in the air you breathe in. Do you remember roughly what this percentage is? Fraction of inspired CO2? That's the amount of CO2 just in the air around us. We're breathing in room air right now. And way back when I asked you what the percentage of oxygen was, other gases in the air, percent of CO2, you ballpark it, about 6%. It's uh, lower than oxygen, but it's still very high. It's not 6 um, What other numbers? How... How far down do you want to go? You know a direction at least to go. It's not six. What, uh, where's the ballpark for BCO2, for fraction of uh, inspired CO2? Lower than six. One. Are you guys guessing? Yeah. yeah. Point zero three. Point zero three. The amount of CO2 in room air, fractions of a percent. Effectively zero. How much oxygen's in room air? Okay, yeah, 20.92, 20.97, 20.79, 20 21. You ballpark it at 21. Um, those those decimal points, people always change them back and forth. I like using 97. Sometimes I'll write 79. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's about 21. The rest is nitrogen. Right? About 79% of the air that you're breathing right now is inert nitrogen. Fraction of that is CO2. Some particulate matter, some pollutants, but uh, we're not going to concern ourselves with those right now. So it's incredibly low. The fraction of inspired CO2 is very, very low. Six is not too far off from what the expired CO2 might be. So you're pretty close. I would say maybe in like the 5%, 4 5% range. But as your muscles, the active tissues in your body produce CO2, you add it to the air in your lungs, and as you breathe out, your end tidal CO2 might be in that 6% region. So just to provide some context. So you're adding the equivalent of 6% CO2 to the air you're breathing out. Let's run through a couple calculations with some representative numbers. Um, ventilation at rest might be about eight liters per minute. Depends on the frequency and the tidal volume. Those are the two things that go into ventilation, but you know that really well. We've covered that in this class. We've covered that in anatomy and exfys. Um, fraction of expired CO2, I'm leaving blank for a second, and then fraction of inspired CO2, 0.03%. And so percent as a decimal, 0 0.0003. Fraction of expired CO2, we usually pause and take a moment because it's not something that we often think about, but uh, we've had it pretty much right on. It's about 6%. I'm using 5.6 in this example. And uh, it might be about 5. You might see it at 4.8. You might see it at 6.2. You're going to get this number from the metabolic cart. It's measuring in real time tidal volume, ventilation, VCO2, or it's, it's calculating those things, but it gets that from measuring things like the expired CO2, expired oxygen, and other constituent gases. So you'll find this in a column on your printout that we've uh, listed specifically for this lab, this series of labs. 5.6%. CO2 in the air you breathe out, minus 0.03% that was there when you breathed it in to begin with, you're adding, what is that then, 5.57% to the air you're breathing out, and you're breathing out at a rate of 8 liters per minute. If you solve that equation, VCO2 is 440 mils of CO2 per minute in this example. That is a number that you'll probably see printed out in its own column on the metabolic card. You'll see numbers just like this, the rate the body is producing CO2. But if you had to, using these building blocks, you could now calculate VCO2 on your own. 
And actually, does this look familiar at all? No? Does the equation look familiar? Net delivery or net uptake equals flow times the AVO2 difference. Notice how these are, are listed very close to each other. Isn't this the same principle? Rate of CO2 production is airflow times the difference between expired and inspired CO2. AVO2 difference. They're just the concentration of the content on either side of the system. This is the Fick equation. We're just using air as the medium instead of blood. The rate of production is the flow of the medium and the difference in concentrations on either side of the, um, the producer, the valve. It's a thick equation. It's nothing scary. So calculate VCO2 according to the thick equation. You calculate cardiac output according to the thick equation. Uh, we are just coming at it from uh, the air, from the external environment versus the internal environment in the uh, light blue square. So let's move on. We have VCO2. This is a number that we are going to earmark, we'll um, bookmark it, save it for later. We're going to plug that into our equation when we get the rest of our terms. But for now, we can stop worrying about VCO2. We've got that done. Now what? The next easiest value to measure or calculate would be arterial CO2. This is just the end tidal CO2 measured in the breath. No finagling this number, no rebreathe, no trapping the CO2. End tidal CO2 because it quickly and completely equilibrates with arterial CO2 is just measured by the metabolic heart. So that's pretty straightforward. After that, Oh, I should make a point to say that when you get to lab, you're going to do this at rest. You'll do it at a couple exercise intensities. And I think that you, when you did the substrate lab, for instance, you are now pros at being able to organize all the measurements and the metabolic cart, and you have a person keeping time, a person exercising. You've got people with roles, right? And you move to the next stage. You've got uh, four or five minutes at your stage to achieve steady state. In this example, in this, in this lab, you're doing a very similar approach. You're doing three, four minutes at steady state, and then you do the rebreathe procedure at the end. Importantly, these first two measurements come from the steady state portion. So your person is exercising. They're breathing normally. They're producing CO2 normally. End tidal CO2 should be unimpeded or uninterrupted. You get these two measurements from the steady state portion. Next, when you manipulate breathing, you can influence steady state. When you trap CO2, when you start breathing into and out of a bag, it's an alarming process. And so your heart rate might change, your blood pressure might change. All the things that you want to remain stable, you should take before you do the rebreathe procedure. But you need to do the rebreathe procedure to trap CO2 and assess venous CO2 percent. Doing this maneuver is disruptive. It will influence steady state. So just make sure that this is the last thing that you measure in lab, the rebreathe and tidal CO2 percent. In the metabolic cart, in the printout, or listed on the slide, these percents are percent of room air, for instance, or percent of gas in the blood. They are pressures. And we need contents. We don't need pressure of gas in millimeters of mercury or in percent of the sample. We need contents of CO2 in mils of CO2 per liter of blood. 
So be aware that as we go through this calculation, we're going to have to convert and find a way to go from percents or, or pressures of gas to a content, mils of CO2 per liter of blood. You'll get the printout in percent, and we need to go to the, uh, the contents in blood. In general, the, the process, when you have either of these numbers, is very similar. Both of these are just end tidal CO2s. They're both in percent. We need contents for both. So a lot of the calculations um, are the same for either of those two values. It's just getting to this initial value in the rebreathe portion that is a little bit tricky. We'll get there. Let's start with end tidal CO2. Um, we're going to get a percent, and we need to change that pressure into contents. When you look at the printout on the screen, you'll get PCO2 in percent. We want PCO2 in millimeters of mercury if we can, because millimeters of mercury, we have a formula that we can use to translate that into contents. If you're given millimeters of mercury from the metabolic heart, great. You can skip this first part. If you're not, you have to remember back to when we talked about the uh, respiratory physiology section in week two, that a percent of a gas is simply the percent of the total pressure, right? Total pressure is the sum of all the individual partial pressures. PCO2 is one of those partial pressures. That 5.6% that I'm measuring at the end of a breath is 5.6% of total. So I need to figure out what that total is. My atmospheric pressure in this example is 760. You'll measure it in lab so that you get an accurate number. We're correcting it for water vapor pressure, which is why we subtract 47. And then it's simply 5.6% of that corrected value. That gives me PCO2 in millimeters of mercury done that calculation many times before. Now, with my pressure in millimeters of mercury, how do I get contents? Uh, throughout, I've tried to keep these slides fairly consistent. You'll be familiar with PCO2 as partial pressure of CO2. You'll start to see some terms like this, CaCO2. Usually, it's written with C uh, subscript A, like, like a lowercase a, CO2. This one is a subscript capital A. It's a little confusing. Um, CaCO2 in whatever its form means content on the arterial side of CO2. CVCO2 would be contents on the venous side of CO2, just so we're up front and clear going forward. So I needed to translate PCO2 to contents. We could spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, but luckily the work has been done for us, and these standard curves give us the answer right at the outset. These standard curves, there are two of them, one for O2 and one for CO2, and they say essentially if you are measuring a partial pressure, depending on which gas you are using to measure that partial pressure, it corresponds with a certain amount of that gas in solution. That's what the contents is. It's the amount of that gas in solution, dissolved in the blood. The lines are very different. And they're different only because the solubility coefficient, which we've seen before, is different for these gases. It's easy to dissolve CO2 in blood. It's hard to dissolve oxygen in blood. So for a given partial pressure, let's say 60, you've got maybe five or six times as much CO2 in that sample at that pressure than you do O2. It's easier to dissolve CO2 in a fluid than it is to dissolve O2. That's why we have hemoglobin. It's really hard to dissolve O2 in blood. 
So hemoglobin gets around that. That's why we have um, that buffering system in place. CO2 dissolves into the blood. We don't want to keep a lot of it there, so we buffer it. Um, this is how we achieve carbonation of uh, soda, pop, beer, CO2 dissolved in solution. Easy to do that. So you can look at this table. You could uh, find a point along the x-axis corresponding to the pCO2 in millimeters of mercury that you just calculated, or you can use this handy equation that I've synthesized for you. CO2 contents is equal to 110.02 times the pCO2, whatever that happens to be, raised to the power of 0 0.4014. Basically, I plotted these points in Excel, and I added a trend line, and then I said, give me the equation of that trend line, and that's what the equation is. So you can just plug your number in directly. The pCO2 in millimeters of mercury just goes in where it says pCO2 in that equation. This equation will give you milliliters of CO2 per liter of blood. Units are going to be a hassle, and I've tried my best to minimize the hassle for you. Using the equation I've laid out here, you get mils of CO2 per liter of blood. Notice this is slightly different than the y-axis on the graph. I've done that on purpose so that you don't have to do an extra conversion step. Use this equation, you get mils per liter. We need per liter in the big equation overall when we do our final calculation. It circumvents itself. Mils of CO2 per liter of blood. So these are the steps that we need in order to calculate a percent into contents. And the contents go right into the indirect FIC equation. That's pretty easy. Plug some numbers into a calculator. Let's see how it works. Arterial CO2. Let's say that my end tidal CO2 is 5.6% as I used on the VCO2 calculation initially. End tidal CO2 is 5.6% during steady state. This is fully equilibrated CO2. I'm assuming this is representative of arterial CO2. Now I'm going to use this number to calculate contents. So I plug it in to figure out what 5.6% means in terms of millimeters of mercury. End tidal CO2 is the percentage of the total. Total atmospheric pressure here is 760. Corrected for water vapor pressure, I simply substitute in my 5.6%. When I simplify this equation and solve and solve, I'm left with 39.93 millimeters of mercury. That is my pCO2 in the uh, expired gas, my end tidal pCO2. And actually, if we go back to the, um, the transit time trace that I just showed you, 39.93 millimeters of mercury, end tidal CO2. That's pretty close to where this, admittedly, a drawing of equilibrium lands. So it's a realistic number, about 40. And you knew that from the oxygen and CO2 cascades, you were tested on the oxygen cascade in midterm one, but the CO2 cascade, you know it starts at 40 millimeters of mercury on the arterial side, the active tissues at about five, it ends at 45, 47 millimeters of mercury when it goes back to the lungs. Oh, and conveniently, I have that here for you in case uh, you don't remember from the respiratory slide. Do you remember the... Uh, the oxygen cascade from 150 in room air to 105 at the alveoli, 100, and then maybe 5 at the mitochondria. CO2, which piggybacks along with it, is 40 in the alveoli. Full equilibration, quick, complete equilibration into arterial blood. Some gets added to the venous blood, and then that quickly 
exchanges when it returns back to the loan. 40 to 46 and then back. So 39.93 is not a bad number to be representative of arterial CO2. And I'm shooting myself in the foot because end title, as it turns out, isn't completely directly um, <clears throat> not related. It is related. It's not reflective of arterial CO2. And the reason for this is that gas in the alveoli, the air in the alveoli, gradually blends with the air throughout the lungs to the environmental air as it leaves. There's a gradient, a pressure gradient, from higher CO2 inside the alveoli to the 0.03% that we have in room air. There's a gradient where that CO2 is contaminated as it leaves the lungs. It's not contaminated a lot, but there is already air in the lungs with a lower CO2 than in the alveoli. All the air that's coming in the conduction system of the lungs, the trachea, the primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi, the respiratory bronchioles, this has an established gradient. This we're breathing normally at steady state. There's a gradient in the lungs. So as the CO2 in the alveoli leaves, it's mixing with that gradient. It's getting contaminated. The entire way out, the value, the, uh, the, the percentage, the, the partial pressure is being um, obscured. It's going to be registered as slightly lower than it should be in the alveoli. We are assuming there's a relatively constant rate of contamination. And it's really difficult to take samples at different points within the lung to prove this. So we're going to assume that there's a uh, relatively uh, constant rate of contamination. And to the best of our abilities, we've found one intermediate equation that predicts what the end tidal CO2, um, as you measure it, would mean in the alveoli or sorry, not in the alveoli, it would mean in the arterial blood. If I measure end tidal CO2 of X percent, accounting for all the contamination that must have occurred as that air traveled out of the lungs, then arterial CO2 would be as follows. This is um, step 1.5, 1B in our calculation of um, the CO2 contents on the arterial side. So because the sample is contaminated, we, we need to figure out how contaminated is it. This equation tells us uh, what the arterial CO2 would be after measuring end tidal CO2 and correcting it for all the contamination. Luckily, you just plug numbers in and your calculator can solve this for you. If I were to take 5.6% end tidal CO2 or 39.93 millimeters of mercury, as we just figured out, and then input it into this equation, I'm going to use 39.93 because I don't want to have to go back and do this correction again. I don't want to do the step that I just did at the end of this equation. I want to figure out what is the arterial CO2 if I'm measuring this at the mouth. In other words, how much has this been contaminated? I can substitute in end tidal CO2 directly. I need one other piece of information, which I'll also get from the printout of the metabolic heart. I also get this at steady state. This is a measure of tidal volume or the size of a breath. If I'm measuring end tidal CO2 and I want to know how much it was contaminated, I need to know how big the breath was to know how much contamination there was. Here, my tidal volume size is 0.03%. 
500 moles, which is a pretty standard tidal volume, as you'll remember from the respiratory physiology section. About 500 mils per breath at rest during steady state breathing. If I sub that in directly, 500 mils or 0.5 liters, 39.93 millimeters of mercury. And then I simplify the things in the brackets. I simplify the, uh, uh, the multiplication on the far right hand side. I add and subtract all those pieces together. My 39.93 measured at the mouth would actually be 41.44 in the arterial blood. So not a lot of contamination. You could argue, why are we even doing this? It's only two millimeters of mercury different. The answer is because we want an accurate calculation of cardiac output. We don't want to settle for second rate information when we know how to correct and uh, determine the true and actual values. So the contamination is small. The actual arterial value is slightly higher, which would make sense because the gradient as the, uh, the air leaves the lungs would dilute it slightly. So after this little tangent, I now have my true arterial CO2 value. Yet it's still in millimeters of mercury. I don't want millimeters of mercury, I want contents. Luckily, I provided you with an easy equation at the outset to convert millimeters of mercury to contents. I want to correct the true arterial version, 41.44 millimeters of mercury into mils of CO2 per liter of blood. So I put 41.44 into this provided equation, raise it to the power of 0 0.4014, multiply these two terms together, and I get a number that looks like this. And all the contents numbers should be in this area. Four to five to six hundred mils of CO2 per liter of blood. This is in its final form. This is the value that you would put into the Fick equation to calculate cardiac output. We are done with the arterial side for now. 490.57 mils of CO2 in every liter of blood. That's pretty striking, right? It's about half, half of the liter of blood, or um, half of the volume um, is CO2. So a number of calculations, but luckily, if we wrap our heads around those calculations, the process repeats itself for the next iteration for the venous and tidal CO2. That's the good news. The bad news is we add uh, a slightly more complicated, slightly smaller monkey wrench into the, uh, the measurement process. But overall, the, uh, the approach is the same. If we get a percentage of CO2 measured at the, the whole body level, then we can calculate, we're comfortable calculating contents. We just did that on the arterial side. Why can't we do it on the venous side? The trick here, okay, we have these two things. The trick here is what percent do you measure? What percent do you measure? And let's um, recall quickly that we are trapping CO2 in the lungs. We're allowing it to build up in the lungs. And we want it to build up to a point where it reaches equilibrium. We should, in theory, if we trapped the gas in the lungs and prevented it from escaping, we should be able to reach a point where the incoming CO2 would no longer diffuse into the alveoli. Right? If it's built up in the alveoli and it matches the venous blood coming in, there wouldn't be any movement. 
there should be a point where there's a plateau. Normally, these numbers look somewhat similar. We just saw this on the oxygen, oxygen cascade. Normally, arterial CO2 is, let's ignore the 41 for now, but it's normally 40. We add some CO2 at the, the metabolically active tissues of the body. That's fully diffused back into the lungs and then escapes the environment. But in this case, we are blocking it. We are trapping CO2 in the lungs so it doesn't escape. What does doesn't escape mean? Doesn't escape means that arterial blood starts to accumulate CO2. No longer are we only sending out 40, millime uh, 40 millimeters of mercury. We're sending out 41. We're sending out 42. We're sending out 43. This is gradually rising until some theoretical point where it would match venous blood. Right? That makes sense because none of it's escaping. The unfortunate part is that we never reach a plateau because we never stop adding CO2. We never reach an equilibrium. We always see this creeping up or rise in CO2 content in the body. There's no one value that we can take from the metabolic cart printout and point to and say this is our equilibrium value. We've got to be creative in determining our um, end tidal CO2 value and determining where the plateau is. So let's think about ways that we might be creative. How might we be clever and figure out where the plateau would be? Let's think in an ideal world, what would this rebreathe procedure look like? If I looked at end tidal CO2 over time and ignore the numbers on the axis, I'm, I just plotted these in Excel and I used random numbers. But if I looked at this accumulation over time, in theory, what I would expect is over some number of seconds, CO2 should go up and then level off. If I didn't keep adding CO2, I should reach a plateau. If the lung uh, system is, the lung bag system is closed, nothing escapes, it would keep all the CO2 in and I'd eventually reach a plateau. I could say, okay, the plateau is here, find out where that is on the y-axis, and that would be my end tidal CO2 value, right? This would be the point where the air matched venous blood. CO2 in the air matched CO2 in venous blood. If this happened, it would be really nice. It doesn't happen. Instead, we see something like this. We still see the same accumulation at the onset, but at some point, blood will recirculate through the body, bringing extra CO2 back with it, and we never actually reach a plateau. The air that we're measuring, the end tidal CO2 that we're measuring, continues to creep up. So where do we draw our plateau line? We can't. It's not possible. It's not possible to draw a plateau line. But I need to figure out where the CO2 would plateau to figure out what my venous CO2 contents are. How do I get around this? The answer lies at the start of the rebreath uh, re procedure. It's odd to think that the answer to where the plateau would lie isn't where the plateau should be. This is contaminated data. There's more CO2 here than there should be. This doesn't mean anything during the rebreath procedure. 
But importantly, the initial accumulation is the same in both cases. As soon as I start breathing into the bag, as soon as I trap CO2 and air in the lungs, it starts to accumulate. Before that blood starts to recirculate and add new CO2, it accumulates at a very similar rate in practice and in theory. So can we use the rate of accumulation to predict where the plateau should be? And the answer is yes. We do it in the following way. I need a good picture of how CO2 is accumulating at the onset. And then what I want to do is look at equal time points. I want to make measurements at every couple seconds, or fractions of a second in this case. It doesn't matter, as long as they're equal time points. What you're going to notice is that every time I go back to make a measurement, the CO2 is going to be slightly higher. Well, that makes sense. It's accumulating. It's trapped in the lungs. Every time I make a measurement, the CO2 is going to be higher. But notice the amount of CO2 that accumulates between these measurements gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Every time I go back, the increase between the last measurement and, the, and this one is going to be slightly smaller. I can use that. In theory, what's a plateau? A plateau is simply, well, over time, if I go back and make enough measurements and the increase is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point, I'm going to make a measurement and there's going to be no increase. That's the definition of a plateau, right? Second measurement matches the first one. It's not increased. It has plateaued. I'm never going to be able to see this during the rebreathe procedure, but I can assume if the rate that the CO2 is decreasing holds up over time, I could project where the plateau would be. If I take equal measurements and the change in CO2 progressively gets smaller, I can extrapolate and say, okay, where would two sequential values be the same? Where would they not be different? I.e., where is the plateau? So this is our clever, tricky premise in doing the rebreathe procedure. And you will take data that you get from the metabolic cart and do exactly that. You will have values for each breath. You, at every end of a breath, you'll have an end tidal CO2 value. You're exercising at steady state, and then the rebreathe procedure starts. And then you've got one breath out that registers a certain percentage. The next breath out registers a percentage so on and so on and so on. With every breath, CO2 accumulates. You're going to take that data that's in your printout, and you're just going to plot it. You've got a time point, you've got an end tidal CO2 value, and you're going to put those numbers onto a graph. So this is at 9 seconds, my end tidal CO2 was whatever. At 11 seconds, it was whatever. So on and so on and so forth. All you're doing by plotting these values is you're making this curve. This curve is the exact same thing that I showed you on the last slide. This is the initial accumulation that I want to get a handle on. So now I go back, I plot at equidistant points every two seconds or every three seconds. You, you pick. Make sure the points are equally spaced apart, 
and then consult your curve. My first measurement gives me this CO2 value. My second one gives me a slightly higher value. My third one, slightly higher but not quite as high, so on and so forth. If I take equally spaced points and then I list the CO2 values, this is the initial accumulation. And you'll notice with each jump, the jump's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What I want to figure out is where does it not even increase? Where's the plateau? You want to make sure that you do this before recirculation occurs. If you're taking equal uh, equidistant points at 30 seconds, then your curve is going to be adulterated. Unadulterated is not uh, affected, but it will be affected. You don't want to be taking these points too far out. You don't want recirculation to occur. You want this within the first 15, 20 seconds tops. I also want to make one point here. Um, the equidistant points, making them equally spaced is really important because what it does is removes time as a factor. There are two things that are causing CO2 to accumulate right now. One, how active are the tissues of the body? How much CO2 are they producing? Two, how much time are you allowing between measurements? How much opportunity is there for that accumulation? If you take points at equal distance, you're removing time from the equation. The only way that these values go up is because you are doing the rebreathe procedure. It's not that you're giving one point more time and one point less time. Make sure they're equidistant. It also allows you to do the next graph that I'm going to show you. On this graph, you could try to draw a trend line. You, maybe you could use Excel and figure out where a curve would end up with a plateau, but it's not precise. Especially if you're drawing it. There's a lot of user error. Instead, a really ingenious way that we can assess where the plateau would be is to plot the difference between points. P1 has a certain value. P2 is higher than P1. Okay, it's accumulating. Absolutely. P3 is higher than P2. Still accumulating. But the difference between those second two points is going to be smaller than the uh, difference between the first two. And every subsequent pair of points, the difference gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If I plot P1 versus P2, X value versus Y value, P1 versus P2, you'll notice P2 is larger. Absolutely, I've got a large initial increase as I start to accumulate CO2. P2 versus P3, P3 versus P4, so on and so on. Eventually, by plotting the difference between points, there should be some theoretical point down the road where Px and Px plus 1 are the same. If I'm plotting two points and their CO2 values are the same, that must be where the plateau occurs. P1 and P2 is only above this line because P2 has a higher CO2 content. Anything above this line means the second point has a higher CO2. As soon as I cross this magical line called the line of identity, this line is the exact same values. The x-axis and the y-axis are 1 and 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3, 
They're mirrored in the line of identity. I can take the points from my initial accumulation, draw a straight line through them, and wherever they cross the line of identity is where the plateau must be. I'm never going to measure this value. But I can measure these, and judging by how the accumulation slows down over time, I can extrapolate and interpret where the uh, plateau would have occurred. So you're going to do this with your data. I'm going to use the values that are shown here in our example moving forward. So everything that we just did, we did the rebreathe procedure, we breathed into the bag, into and out of the bag, and I trapped CO2 in such a way that it accumulated and I was able to predict where the plateau would be. If it were possible to observe it, I would have observed it at 10.08%. So from 5.6%, which is a normal end tidal CO2, to 10.08%, which would be the theoretical plateau when you close the lung bag system, now I want to use that information to calculate what's my venous CO2. You might be thinking in all of this, this is painful, but it's not an arterial catheter in your right atrium. So that's good. I guess it wouldn't ever be an arterial catheter, it would be a venous catheter. A catheter nonetheless in your right atrium. You could either calculate some numbers and draw a few graphs or have a catheter inserted into your heart. I'd probably choose calculating, so it's nice to always provide some context. The plateau that I just got, 10.08%. Don't want percent. Luckily, now we're in familiar territory. I can take that percentage, plug it into that equation, 10.08% of the total atmospheric pressure, corrected for water vapor pressure, gives me PVCO2 in millimeters of mercury as 71.87. Seventy one point eight seven millimeters of mercury. PV CO two is higher than arterial CO two, which is good. It's maybe a little bit higher than we would have expected, but that's also probably because this is a made up number that we pulled from a graph. But it is uh, going in the right direction, which is good. Still, millimeters of mercury is not contents. So I should have to correct this for contamination, right? Wrong. I'm doing you a favor here. The venous side, you don't have to correct for contamination because the process of doing the rebreathe eliminates the contamination. There's no gradient between the alveoli and the outside air, as soon as you close that lung bag system, you bring everything into equilibrium. You eliminate the gradient. There's no contamination. So I saved you a whole set of calculations. Instead, I'm going to take my 71.87 millimeters of mercury and figure out what that means in terms of contents. I plug it right into this equation. Notice I, I jump from step one to step three. I'm not doing the contamination step. That number just goes right into the PCO2 value. It's raised to the power of 0.4014. And then I solve and simplify, giving me 611.91 mils of CO2 per liter of venous blood. No step two, because there is no dilution. You are forcing equilibrium. You are removing the contamination in the lung bag system.
Now, before we get to the big reveal and put this all together, there have been a lot of formulas, graphs, figures, concepts thrown at you. This is why understanding the premise of why the rebreathe allows us to figure out venous CO2 and why end tidal CO2 approximates arterial CO2. The theory behind it is important to have a good grasp on. What is not clear? Something's not clear for one or two or all of you. Let's try to sort it out now before last before we do the big reveal, before we move on. And you have to do this calculation a number of times. What's not making sense, if anything? Often, the answer is in plotting the difference between points, trying to figure out where the plateau is. Does that concept sit OK with you? It doesn't have to sit well, but if it sits OK, as you sit and consider it, let it marinate, it will begin to make more sense. If it's not completely confusing, then you're in a good spot. So far, so good. Okay. Okay. We do have a class on Thursday where before the lab, as you read through the pre-lab talk and you realize what you have to do, you can come into class on Thursday morning and ask all kinds of questions in preparation for lab. You can review these notes, review the video, ask all kinds of questions in preparation for lab. We can discuss it then. But for right now, it would really be satisfying to calculate cardiac output and then call it like a day. We spent all that time calculating VCO2, calculating arterial CO2 contents, venous CO2 contents. Why don't we put it all together? All the other factors have been solved. The only thing that's not solved is cardiac output. So if that's the only element in this equation that's not solved, we can solve for it. Let's solve for it. These numbers are familiar. We've just spent the last hour and a bit calculating them. Way back when, we figured out VCO2 was 440 mils of CO2 per minute. We just finished calculating venous and our, uh, arterial CO2 contents in mils of CO2 per liter of blood. Now, I plug those numbers in and solve. This is the easiest equation of all the ones we've looked at today. Let's do the subtraction in brackets first. The difference between arterial and venous CO2 is 121.34 mils of CO2 per liter. That is, there are 120 more mils of CO2 in the venous blood than the arterial blood. Now all I have to do is divide both sides by 121.34. If I do that, it's going be slightly complicated how these um, uh, how the units carry through. So I'm going to write this out deliberately for you in case you don't remember back to grade 9 or 10 algebra and um, dividing on both sides of the equation and how the um, how the units change and how to cross off units if there's uh, common units on the top and the bottom. So what I'm doing to get from the second last step to the last one is I move 121.34 over to the left-hand side, and then I essentially just flip it. So Q is on the left, the numbers are on the right, and this is mils of CO2 per minute, 440 mils of CO2 per minute. If I'm dividing by these terms, I'm multiplying by the inverse, Time, oh, that was quick. Dividing by mils of CO2 per liter of blood is the same thing as multiplying by the inverse. Notice that I have mils of CO2 both in the numerator and in the denominator. Those will cancel out. I'm left with liters of blood per minute, which you should have because 
pew cardiac output is expressed in liters of blood per minute. When I solve 440 divided by 121.34, I get a resting cardiac output of about 3.6 liters per minute. which is a little low. My theory as to why this number is a little low, now that I'm looking back, is just the 10.08% that we used on the Venus side made the Venus number higher than it should have been, which made this difference greater than it should have been. And a larger numerator makes for a smaller number. Uh, you will hopefully have better luck in lab getting more realistic numbers. 3.6 is not outside of the realm of possibility. This is only resting as well. Um, a nice way to check whether your number is realistic, I don't have it written here, but 5 times VO2 plus 5 is a nice way to check whether or not your cardiac output numbers are uh, realistic or not. If you have a VO2 of one liter per minute, five times one plus five should give you a cardiac output of about 10 liters per minute. Five times VO2 plus five, a really easy calculation to do in your head to just see if um, this ballparks properly. VO2 is not in here. I don't have an example to show you. You'll have VO2 on your printout from the metabolic cart that you can do this if you want to just verify it. But 3.6 is good for rest. Exercise might be 10 to 15 at a moderate intensity. Um, high intensity for you folks might be 25 to 30 liters per minute. Elite athletes, highest you'll ever see is 40 liters per minute cardiac output. So that's the range that you'll see. Any questions? Too many questions to ask right now? That's fair. <laughs>